us to consider a commission from Christ to his disciples to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. These are the very things his disciples have seen him do and that we have sought to witness for our own lives in this Lenten season of recovery. What will we do with this commission? How will we address ongoing pain with hope and conviction, even though we ourselves are healed and yet still healing? had been teaching, healing, touching, and transforming lives for three years. His presence in the midst of suffering had offered hope to so many. And
And yet, his ways had also challenged the power of privilege. As we have seen in our Lenten journey, his actions had crossed boundaries of stigma in so many ways. When healing was needed, no one was left outside of compassion. And this threatened to upset the hierarchy of things, touching the untouchables, mixing with folk outside or below his status, raising up the faith of outsiders and nobodies had gotten attention. The last shall be first was not sitting well with the first of society, government, and religion. His popularity was evident the day he and his disciples set foot in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Those in seats of power who wanted to keep the peace, even an unjust, unholy, unfair, unseeing peace, were all talking about the problem. Crowds where Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem were infiltrated by leaders seeking to catch him in controversy. Time and again, Jesus answered with truth and faith, leaving the naysayers speechless. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and all of, and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. 
But they said, Not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Matthew's Gospel is particularly concerned with the indicting of the leaders of Jesus' own people for their role in his crucifixion. In this Lenten journey of recovery, we have confessed our own roles, the church's complicity at times, and the brokenness of the world. We have acknowledged our need to restore, repair, renew our holy vessels so that we might be able to create and imagine new possibilities, new solutions for the healing that is required to make the world more just and more whole. Let us confess. God of suffering, you take no delight in the destruction of your creation, your people. Our own broken edges, sharp and raw, contribute to the pain sometimes, especially during prolonged difficulty. We find ourselves struggling. We cannot manage it on our own, yet we try, forgetting to turn to you, forgetting to turn to each other, forgetting the power you offer, the commission you give to turn our tears to balm to use our broken edges to cleave new realities of justice and hope. It all feels overwhelming, and so we look away. Help us, healer. Show us our connection to your healing power. Forgive our disbelief. Move us to move, one step at a time, toward greater care for one another. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? For this ointment could have been sold for a large sum and the money given to the poor. But Jesus aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Oil was used in many ways by ancient peoples. Mixed with various herbal properties, it served as a healing balm, bringing increased blood flow and salve to the body. It was used in practical purposes as well, as a skin softener or an odor reducer in cleansing practices and it was used as an agent of significance in many rituals. The story of the woman with an alabaster jar of oil is a symbolic ritual action of great power. The pouring of oil on Jesus' head stood in the traditions of anointing leaders, kings to be specific, on the head. Many of the symbols in the story of Holy Week point to the sovereignty of Jesus. 
most of them carried out by unlikely and so-called unsanctioned people. This ritual of oil on the head of Jesus was carried out by an unnamed woman whose action of love, devotion, and the clear message that this teacher was her sovereign forever got angry reactions even from those who claim to love Jesus the most. Are we, like those first disciples, in danger of withholding our resources of extravagant love? Do we hesitate to proclaim the sovereignty, the reign of love and justice, equity and relief, healing and wholeness, even as we proclaim to be disciples of the one who is love itself? Then Jesus turns the meaning of her anointing act on its head, so to speak. He recalls another use of oil on the body, common in this time, that of embalming the dead. This must have been a shock to the disciples, beyond even the shock that they had already expressed. His message was clear. Now is not the time to worry about the treasure. The true treasure was in relationship, the one they had right before them, right now. And so this is our first anointing act this evening. In a moment, I will invite you to dip your fingers into the oil and place your hand on the top of your own head if you are on your own this evening. Or if you are with others, you may choose to place your hand on each other's head in turn. Allow your hand to rest there for a few moments. And as you do so, I invite you to think of the people whose extravagant love has been poured out upon you, offering you care in the midst of your own healing journey. Feel that care as affirmation of your worth and value. Know that this kind of love is always and already available to you through relationship with the Divine One. Take your time as the music plays. Allow the warmth of the hand to melt into your being, filling you with assurance that the Holy Presence moves with warmth and light within your holy vessel, no matter how broken or far from life you feel. You are part of the reign of love in this world. Accept this anointing so that you might also offer this anointing, this healing, wherever it is needed. Matthew's gospel 
omits the details of the arrival of the disciples for the meal. We know from other gospel accounts that the customary washing of feet upon arrival took on a particular significance that night. Not only practical, but symbolic. The washing of feet in the ancient world indicated status, with servants washing the feet of their masters, pupils washing the feet of their teachers, children and wives washing the feet of the man of the house. Jesus was all these things of reverence and honor to those gathered that night. And yet we know he washed their feet, rejecting the norms and indicating a new order of things, a new way to honor one another regardless of status. We do not know if Jesus' washing that night of the Last Supper was followed by an anointing with a fragrant oil, but we do know that this extra act of tending to the feet was done to express the highest form of respect and honor in the ancient world. And so our second act of anointing this evening follows in this tradition. You may wish to remove your shoes if you have any on, and if that's comfortable for you. We will rub some oil on the tops of our feet and on the top of our hands. Again, you can do this for yourselves or with and for others as you feel comfortable. As we rub some oil on the top of our feet, or whatever we use to move ourselves about in the world, we honor our efforts to go where healing is needed most. May we be blessed and strengthened for our work in the world. May we go and serve and remember to honor the places we go as holy vessels of God's love. I invite you to do that. And together, as we rub some oil on the top of our hands, we honor the efforts we have undertaken, or will undertake, to make this world a better place for all. May we be blessed and strengthened for our work in the world. May we reach out and serve and remember to honor the people we encounter as holy vessels of God's love. We join together in song.
When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to, to him after another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Disciples, I invite you to repeat after me. I will never desert you. I will never desert you. I will never deny you. I will never deny you. I will never desert you. I will never desert you. I will never deny you. I will never deny you. I will never desert you. I will never desert you. I will never deny you. I will never Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake 
and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let us take this moment as Jesus did, to dare ask the question that comes from the most broken places of our souls, our deepest grieving. It is in acknowledging what feels most broken, most cynical, most impossible, that healing can occur. We must address the roots of our ill in order for the self of God's desire for us to enter. You are invited to a time of reflection, becoming awake, staying awake, to the deep need within us and around us. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went again away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping? and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? which say it must happen this way. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled.
Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they may put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at least two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophecy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See it to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed. He went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them back, put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took thirty pieces of silver, the price of one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me.
Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, and not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now, at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of these two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, Let him be crucified. And then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Gabbatha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. And we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, 
Lima Sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran out and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were, were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tomb and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly this man was God's son.
there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it on his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. When he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. We come to our third and final anointing in our remembrance of Jesus in this moment of Holy Week. All during Lent, we have remembered the healing acts of Jesus, the radical nature of the boundaries he crossed in order to restore wholeness, the desire of God that transcends all things we do to stand in the way, including the death of kindness, love, and compassion. One ingredient was perhaps the most significant in all the purposes of anointing, healing, cosmetic, and ritual. It was among the gifts at the birth of Jesus and was no doubt present in the preparation of his body after death. Myrrh was a treasured element of sap from the life of trees. It provided healing properties for a myriad of afflictions. It was used in ritual anointing of leaders and in purification. It was likely more costly than the other birth gifts of gold and frankincense put together. And so we are inspired by the connection of healing and death through the common use of myrrh and the story of Jesus. In this moment, as we sit at the cross of Christ, are there things that need to die within us to make room for the resurrection of our lives? Are there things we can lovingly lay to rest that are no longer needed? Indeed, that may stand in the way of our recovery of wholeness. What can you let go of in this moment? Old hurts and disappointments of the past that need forgiveness. Perhaps God has already forgiven you, but you cannot forgive yourself. When you are ready, I invite you to join me in dipping your finger into your oil one last time. And then make the sign of the cross on your forehead. This act is a sign and seal, a practice begun in the early church as they baptized new members, reminding us of our death and resurrection in Christ. What is embalmed in death is made new in resurrected life. This is what we believe. This is what we know because it is what Jesus promised. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, Though they die, will live. next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees had gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore I commanded the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may go steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. Now go in silence, but not in despair. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears. 
I am with you always. And may the Spirit hover, move, and deliver salve to your soul until we meet again on the day of Christ's crucifixion. Amen.